wherever you are and whatever you're doing. I really appreciate you dropping by and giving my stories a listen. So, this one's not dedicated to anybody in particular, just all of you. Thanks for coming by so often and listening to the stories. Well, I've got another great one for you this evening, and I'm pleased to say it's another story by Bo Whiskey. I've um, done quite a few of hers recently, and they're always really popular, so I think you're going to enjoy tonight's one. And after about 20 minutes, you'll hear the end of that story, and then there's a couple more tagged on at the end as well, uh, just in case you haven't heard them before. Okay, everyone, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because now it's time to listen. The day of the funeral was one of the longest days of my life. I could hardly hear any of the words of the eulogy or anecdotes shared by family and friends. All I could do was stare at the photos that passed in steady rotation on the screen. Whenever someone approached the front for their turn to share something, the projector would be blocked momentarily and I would be able to break my gaze and look at the floor. This never lasted, though, and within a couple of minutes, I'd be back to staring at the pictures, lost in thoughts of how I would never see my sister's beaming face again. I felt my eyes begin to well up with tears when an image of Leah, myself, and our parents was displayed. It was from our trip to the carnival, we were all smiling and happy. I could never have foreseen the tragedy that would follow only a few short weeks later. No one could have. It happened almost a year ago. Leah and I were at home when an officer came knocking on the door. Being the older one at age 17, Leah answered the door. I can recall hearing a thud and rushing over to find that she had fallen to her knees. Our parents had been in a horrible car accident. The officer, a greying man that was probably in his mid to late forties, crouched down in front of Leah, asking if she was okay. She didn't respond. Once I was standing beside her, Leah grabbed my arm and pulled me down into a hug so tight I thought my ribcage was going to be crushed. At some point, the officer asked if there was anyone he could call to come be with us. Shortly after, our aunt and uncle arrived. Leah was in shock and didn't speak for hours. When she finally was able to mumble something, she ended up rushing to the bathroom vomiting. She was hysterical for days after that. We moved in with our aunt and uncle in the days following the memorial for our parents. Life never actually normalized in the next year, despite trying to continue like the typical 17 and 14 year olds that we were. We were met with hesitant smiles that oozed pity for months. Everyone felt sorry for us. I was relieved when people finally stopped looking at me like a lost puppy. But here I was again, the lost puppy, sitting amidst a bunch of people I didn't care about and waiting for my sister to be lowered into the ground next to our parents. No one seemed to really know what to say around me anymore. I don't blame them. What are you supposed to say when someone who, within a year of losing both parents, had then lost her sister. The three people I grew up with were now gone. Even being worried about what words to use in my presence, I knew what most of them were thinking. Oh, poor Amy, losing her sister like that. How could Leah throw away her entire life? How could she leave her little sister? They blamed Leah for taking her own life. But I didn't. I understood. 
Leah had never been the same after our parents. The funeral continued, and everyone moved to the cemetery for the burial, myself included. A few final words were shared. A poem was read, and the casket was lowered into the ground. My body felt numb as I watched. Slowly, everyone began to leave, until the only ones left were my aunt and uncle, myself, and the burial custodian, who was completing preparations to return the soil back to the hole my sister was now laid in. Amy, do you want to stay here for a bit longer? My aunt asked me, touching my shoulder lightly. I nodded. Okay, we'll wait for you at the car. Take all the time you need, my uncle chimed in. I only nodded again in response. I listened to their soft, grassy steps recede and took a deep breath, the exhale ragged and broken. I didn't want to cry anymore, but it would seem I didn't have a choice. The tears that had been welling up off and on throughout the day, finally made their way to the corners of my eyes and began slipping down my cheeks. I knelt down and sat on my heels, facing the two headstones and open, occupied grave. Absent-mindedly, I plucked blades of grass from the ground and began dropping them into a pile. I'm not sure how long I sat there with my family. The attendant left at some point without me realizing it. I was alone now, in every sense. I had my aunt and uncle, but they weren't my parents. They weren't Leah. How was I supposed to return to school, where everyone would be walking on eggshells around me? How was I supposed to learn to drive? Who was I going to share my crushes with? When the silent tears stopped flowing, I stood and turned away. As I solemnly walked to the car, a single thought repeated in my mind. How dare you, Leah? I didn't eat dinner. I didn't feel like I could stomach a single bite of anything. As soon as the sun started to fade, I shut myself in what was now only my room. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to escape everything. I just wanted to sleep. The black dress, stockings and heels that I had so carefully picked out that morning now lay in a heap on the floor where I had thrown them. They felt dirty, tainted somehow. I donned a brown tank top and shorts before climbing under my cover. Before lying down with my head on the pillow, I sat there, looking around my room. It was a mess of clothes, books, various lotions, knickknacks, pictures and papers. Despite this, it still felt empty, without Leah in the bed opposite mine. When I lay down, I couldn't help but feel a few salty drops seep onto my pillow as I stared at the empty bed. My eyes fluttered open and blinked sluggishly as I looked to the alarm clock on top of my dresser. It read 2.47 a.m. Why had I woken up? Instead of facing Leah's bed, I was now facing the wall on my other side. I watched for a few minutes as shadows grew and shrank on it from cars passing by. I was ready to give up on trying to determine why I was awake, when I thought I heard a soft laugh from behind me. I flipped over and sat up quickly when I realized it couldn't be Leah giggling from something she read like she used to. Leah was gone now. When I saw that the bed was empty, I sighed. She would never be sitting in bed reading comics ever again. I scanned the room and found it to be the same, devoid of any other life than my own. 
I eased myself back down to my pillow, concluding that I must be missing Leah more than I realized. I closed my eyes, not to sleep, but to remember. Why did you have to do it, Leah? I loved you. You were my sister. So why did you have to do it? I thought back to our final conversation. It had been less of a conversation and more of a fight. She'd been going through a box of old notebooks and schoolwork, trying to find something when she discovered the old composition notebook I used to use as a journal. She skimmed through it to figure out what it was, and when she came across an entry I'd written shortly before our parents died, she confronted me. It quickly turned into yelling at one another. She demanded to know why I would write such things about our father. I tried to explain to her that it was all true. The nightly visits, the hidden bruises, the pain in specific areas. The loss of my virginity. When she refused to believe me, I screamed at her that she was just like our mother, who did nothing and ignored my pleas for help to make it stop. Leah just couldn't and wouldn't believe that our loving parents, the ones who did everything they could to give us whatever we wanted, could be so crass and malicious. She threw the notebook at me and told me that I was full of shit, that I just wanted attention, and I'd do or say anything to get it, that I'd always lied to put the spotlight on myself. I cursed at her and stormed out of the bedroom, then through the front door, slamming it with a loud bang behind me. Once I knew my aunt and uncle would be home from work, I returned for a quiet dinner because it wasn't unusual for us to barely speak. They didn't have any idea about the argument Leah and I had just had a few short hours ago. The following morning, I'd been jolted awake by a scream when my aunt discovered Leah in the backyard. It was ruled a suicide immediately and determined that the cause of death was strangulation. They speculated that she wanted to be absolutely sure she would die, as they found cuts on her arms and a large dose of hypnotic medication in her system. No one could say why she wanted to meet death so desperately. It was heartbreaking, but people weren't entirely surprised, given how melancholy and miserable she had seemed. Now, As I lay there in the dark, eyes clenched tight, remembering that final day with my sister, I felt guilty. The last things we spoke to each other were hurtful. I rolled onto my side and buried my face in the pillow. I sobbed until I couldn't breathe out of my nose anymore. Reluctantly, I pushed the blankets aside and shuffled into the bathroom to retrieve some toilet paper. I blew my nose and discarded the snotty tissue. I tore off another piece and was wiping my nose when I turned and saw the mirror. My blood ran cold. My heart stopped. My lungs captured a gasp and held it. I wanted to scream, but my vocal cords forgot how to function. Next to my own reflection was Leah. Her skin looked pale, her brunette hair stringy and lackluster, her eyes drab but angry. She glared into my reflection. I spun around more out of reflex than anything else. I expected to see nothing, but there she was, standing just behind me. Her material countenance was more terrifying than her reflection. Her skin looked thinner than when she was alive. Purple and blue veins stood out against the pale, grey flesh that she now possessed. I saw the bruising around her neck from where the rope had tethered her to the tree. She grinned 
with blue-gray lips, as she held her hands out, palms up, to me, to show me the cuts along her wrists. Dark and blood dripped steadily from the wounds and onto the bathroom floor. I backed up to the counter and gripped the edge with both hands. Leah took a step forward, bloodied arms still reaching out to me, her grin widening. Aside from anger, I could see determination in her cold eyes. Leah was always the type to fiercely pursue what she wanted. She took another step forward, and I leaned back as far as I could, the edge of the countertop pressing hard against my body. Frigid hands cut my face as my dead sister leaned forward staring directly into my eyes. Oh dear, Amy. Mom and Dad know what you did. Cutting the brake lines on their car. They, and I, also know how you made sure I wouldn't tell anyone what I figured out. Tell me, did you really think you'd get away with this? Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon. Why did you do it? The question was so dryly put and unemotional. It was a simple string of words, but I didn't think there was any simple answer. I shrugged. I don't like myself. The tall man flipped through some papers on a clipboard and asked, Did that start before or after the accident? I suppressed an eye roll. <laughs> Well, Doc, the easiest response would be the accident. Although I can't say I was a great human being before that. But really, it started when I realized I could see how people die. The accident, I answered. Knowing that if I told him the truth, I'd end up locked away for a very long time. He continued reviewing the paperwork that detailed what the accident had medically caused and how I had been treated. I tried my best not to look at him. I didn't want to look at anyone anymore. I knew he was dressed in a crisp white coat, with a blue button-up and black slacks. I knew he had short, sandy blonde hair and dark eyes. I knew what he was supposed to look like, but that's not what I saw. What I saw was a gaping knife wound in the side of his neck, blood-soaked clothes, a torn shirt from another stab wound in his abdomen. I saw dirt and tiny pebbles stuck to the side of his face from falling onto the ground. I saw pale, dead skin and smelled steak and bourbon. The smells were usually worse, but this time it was at least bearable enough that I didn't gag. 
Okay, well, Clarissa, I'm going to send you for a psych evaluation and some blood work to start in the morning. I'd expect you to be here at least the mandatory 72 hours, just like any other person who would attempt suicide. Hopefully we can figure out why you feel this way, if the accident somehow caused it, and get you all fixed up and on your way soon. For now, just try to rest. I nodded and laid back against the pillow. The doctor put the chart back in its place and walked out of the door. I glanced at the girl in the bed next to mine. She seemed engrossed in some TV show about a detective or something. I rolled over to my side, facing away from her, closed my eyes and let myself drift off to sleep, aided by the painkillers in my system. When I awoke, it was completely dark in the room and my bed felt alien to me. I looked around at the bland surroundings and remembered that I was in the hospital. Something seemed off, though. There was a smell. I sprung into a sitting position quickly when I realized I was smelling smoke. I couldn't hear any alarms going off or any chaos in the hall, so I was left confused and a little terrified. I pushed myself out of the bed and walked to the closed door, peeking through the window and seeing nothing amiss. But it smells like there's a fire. How can no one else notice that? I thought a sense of panic gripping my chest. I took a few deep breaths and moved into the bathroom, shutting the door behind me. When the small room became bathed in fluorescent light, I saw my reflection. A pale, thin girl that desperately needed to eat and sleep and stop seeing dead things. It clicked then that I was probably smelling the fire from someone's death. Maybe someone had been admitted in the next room, or there was a nurse that was destined to die in some sort of blaze. This thought helped to calm me a bit. I used the toilet, washed my hands and splashed water on my face before exiting the bathroom and climbing back into my small, white, impersonal hospital bed. I didn't hate hospitals, really, but I hated how vanilla they were. There's almost never any color or character. I sat in the bed, absent-mindedly staring towards the window, which was on the wall closest to the other patient, when I realized she was sound asleep, half curled up on her side, facing me. She looked normal. From the little light shining in from the window of the door on my side of the room, and the lights from the parking lot shining through the window on her side of the room. I could see that, other than some bruises and scratches on her arms and cheek, she didn't look dead. She looked alive. She looked like she was supposed to. But why? There was movement in my peripheral, and I felt my breath involuntarily catch in my lungs. I followed the movement to look under her bed. On her back lay a girl, almost identical to the one in the bed. She was reaching up and running fingers over the bottom of the bed. Her arms were darkened and dirty. Her hair was splayed around her head and looked singed. Suddenly, she slammed her hands, palms down, to the floor on each side of her, and snapped her head to look at me. I realized where the smoke smell had come from now. Half of her face was covered in blackened, crispy skin that looked like it was falling or peeling away from the bone. I saw that she had the pale skin of a corpse where it wasn't covered in dirt or charred beyond recognition. I choked and gagged on the sudden wave of burnt flesh and hair that assaulted my nose and throat. She stared at me both of us frozen for at least a minute. Then she slowly raised a finger to her lips and whispered, Shh. I felt myself barely nod. The burned girl pulled herself slowly from under the bed, on the opposite side from me. I watched as her dead legs bent and shuttered, while she positioned herself to stand. Once she was standing, still doubled over at the waist, 
I moved my gaze from below the bed to above it, where she was standing next to her living twin. There were barely any audible pops and a slight wheezing as she fully righted herself. She gently placed a hand, burned with sections of white bone showing, on the shoulder of the sleeping girl. She looked at the girl with what I can only describe as love and compassion, as if she deeply cared for her. I saw her grip tighten around the girl's shoulder, and her black nails dig into the fabric of her hospital gown. Those dead eyes flashed up at me once again, and a wide, malicious smile spread across her twisted face. The half that was destroyed gave a slight ripping noise as the corner of her mouth tore open to make her smile even wider. In one quick motion, she reached over, yanked the girl's jaw open and crawled on top of her. The broken, blistered and scorched body contorted with awful tears, pops and cracks as it forced itself into the girl's mouth and down her throat. I watched in horror, unable to move, to scream, to breathe. Right before the sleeping girl's mouth closed, I saw something bright in her throat. The dead girl's eye, looking out at me. Once again I heard, shh. When I was young, I think about ten, I shared a room with my little brother, who was about five at the time. His name is Christian. My sister was still a baby, and the other room, aside from my parents' room, was set up as a nursery. I really didn't mind sharing a room with him, even though I'm a girl. Plus, we had bunk beds, and I was definitely one of those kids that thought bunk beds were inexplicably awesome. I slept on the top bunk, being the older one. Luckily for me, he wasn't prone to nightmares, so I wasn't woken up by screaming for parents or other antics we as children go through at night. One night was different, though. I remember something happening. Now, to help you understand a bit easier, let me explain the layout of the bedroom the best I can. The room faced the front of the house, jutting out past the front door that it was next to. On this wall was a large window. Across from the window was the doorway. When you walked through the door, you had a few feet of wall extending forward on either side of you, with a closet in the wall to the left. Just past the closet door, the room opened up. It was in that far corner, where the wall from the side of the closet met the actual left wall of the room that the bunk beds were positioned, running lengthwise along the wall. I think there was a dresser and a toy chest on the opposite wall, but I don't really remember, and it's not that important. Outside of the house, there was a walkway that led from the driveway, which was to the right of the house if you were facing it, to the left if you were standing in the doorway to the room facing the window, to the front door. Another sidewalk led from the front door directly down to the street, it was a nice sized front yard with a good amount of space between the house and street itself, meaning you could hear a car pass by, but you couldn't hear someone's steps against the pavement if they were walking on the road. This specific night, something caused my brother to wake up. Maybe he'd had a bad dream. I'm not really so sure at this point. All I remember is being woke up by the bedroom light flicking on above me, and my mom rushing to his bed where he was crying. She picked him up, said some soothing words to him, and apologized for waking me up. I told her it was okay, and I think I asked if Christian was alright. He was crying into her shoulder, and she probably assured me that he would be fine. She flipped the light switch as she carried him out of the room, and I was once again bathed in comfortable darkness. Now, I've always had a hard time going back to sleep once I've been woken up, especially if I talk to someone. 
unless I'm absolutely exhausted. It takes an annoyingly long time to get myself to slip back into the cocoon of rest and dreams. Sometimes it doesn't even work. I'd rolled over to face the wall with my eyes closed when I heard something from outside. It sounded like bootsteps on cement. My eyes shot open as I listened. The steps seemed to be slowly getting closer and it gave me the distinct impression that someone was walking from the road to our front door. When I heard the steps halt, I held my breath in an attempt to eliminate any noise that would interfere with what was outside. Just then, I heard my mom and stepdad, Christian's father, come into the room to tuck him back in. As my mom was putting him into his bed, I whispered to my stepfather that I'd heard someone outside on the sidewalk. He walked over and pushed the blinds apart with his fingers, looking outside. I watched him intently, my heart pounding. He walked back over to the bunk beds and told me there was nothing, that I probably just heard an animal or something. Somehow, I just knew he wouldn't believe me if I pressed it so I told him that he was probably right. He and my mum kissed and told my brother goodnight, then told me goodnight again. My mum turned on my brother's favourite tape, George Strait, to fall asleep to. <laughs> yes, this was back in the days when cassette tapes were still around, although CDs were generally more popular. They left the room, leaving the door ajar just a bit from what I could hear. As my brother sniffled a couple of times and began falling back to sleep, I couldn't help but lie there in my bed, motionless for at least ten minutes, trying to listen for whatever it was that was outside. When I didn't hear anything, I sighed to myself and rolled back onto my side to go to sleep, just as I was beginning to fall asleep. I heard the steps once again, even closer. It sounded like they walked the entire way up the sidewalk and then stepped into the grass just below the window. I imagined a large man in rough-looking cowboy work boots standing just outside the window, peering in and somehow being able to see past the blinds and into the room. I'm not sure how much longer I lied there like that, but it was a good while. I'd venture a guess for at least half an hour. Eventually, I did fall asleep, even though my nerves were still buzzing. I never heard the steps recede.